there we go. Right, let's go. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna have a vision quest. Is everybody ready for the vision quest? Um, what you're gonna need to do for this is to close your eyes and there will be a point in the vision quest where you're asked to open your eyes. Um, so listen out for it. And there's also a bit in the vision quest where you'll be asked to unmute your mic. So please, please listen out for that. And remember to unmute and to join the conversation at that point. So please, everybody, close your eyes now. This is, this is the time for us to get into the mood, okay? Uh, so you wake up in your bedroom at home. The bed covers feel so soft and warm, but you know that the forecast is good outside. You can see the sky from your bedroom window and it's bon con one out there. You get up, you head out, you climb into the car and breathe in its familiar smell. You begin to drive and you twist and turn through the country roads of the Yorkshire countryside. Above you, the sky is blue and the familiar dry stone walls flick past your window as you zip along. When you arrive at the parking spot, you step out of the car and into the morning sun, feeling its warmth on your face. You take your gear out of the car and shoulder it onto your back, feeling its familiar weight and start the walk to the crag. As you head up and your legs start to grow a little tired, the thought of a magical day out spurs you on. We've arrived on the moor now. You can open your eyes and look, is that a curlew? No, it's you. <laughs> 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 and is that? I think it's a dodo. Is that an owl? <laughs> so at last, we have come to the sacred place. While empires have risen and crumbled, the stones here have stood still, silent steadfast waiting for this day and this time for the touch of a hand and the scrape of a smearing shoe to breathe life into their rocky spirits but look what is that a gamekeeper he doesn't look pleased to see you He's starting to look a bit menacing oh no so you can open your open your eyes now uh starting to be menacing and we need to we need to do the chant we need to cast a spell on him to appease him please unmute your microphones and repeat with me i am one with the moors the moors are one with me i am one with the moors the moors are one with me louder i am one with the moors the moors are one with me. I am one with the moors. The moors are one with me. I am one with the moors. The moors are one with me. Look, he's going now. We've appeased the gamekeeper. <laughs> We're free to climb. That's the end of the vision quest. So, thank you for joining us. Oh. Um. So let me get my presentation back up. So you might be wondering what is unknown stones, or you might not be, you might know what it is. But unknown stones is a website where, um, oh, hang on, shit, I need to share my screen again. I'm so useless at this Zoom. So, right. Have you got my screen back now? Yep. Yes. Okay. So Unknown Stones is a website. It's www.unknownstones.com. And it's a place where you can go and you can find 
um, little mini PDF guides for bouldering spots, mainly bouldering spots. There's a couple of little trad routes in there, but mainly bouldering spots in Yorkshire. And it's been put together mainly by people like Paul Clark and John Hunt. Um, and it's pretty self-explanatory, really. There's this front page here. It kind of works best on a, on a desktop. Uh, not not on a desktop on a mobile because um, since it started when there were about 30 crags on there it's grown and grown and grown and there now must be well over 100 crags um, so the menus don't work quite so well on a desktop Whoop. shouldn't have had that beer don't, quite, don't work quite so well on a desktop but uh, it works best on a phone and there's a little map with lots of pins on it to show you where the crags are and there's like a table that summarizes each of the crags. So really, like, that is what Unknown Stones is. And there's not a huge amount more to say than that, but I will fill the rest of this presentation. So who's, who's done these scripts? We've got Paul Clark, who's this guy on the left, uh, John Hunt's done scripts, uh, Jordan Byers, Pete Jackson, Dave Prince, Russell Bowman, Robin Muller, Tom Peckett, James Turnbull, Ben Finley, Steve Phelps, Malcolm Townsley, me, and lots more people. It's like a, a big community effort. So if you found a funny little bouldering spot somewhere, then you can do an Unknown Stones topo and we'll put it on there and people might start going to your little venue and doing stuff. So share the love. Um, there's also a thing on the website called the Brimham Project, which is definitive coverage of bouldering at Brimham, which is really useful because it's not really been documented that well before. So in the presentation, normally at this point, I, um, I do a little chat about history and I talk about Tony Barley and stuff. But today we have a living piece of history with us in the form of Paul Clark. So shall we have a chat, Paul, about Yorkshire grit exploration? Yes, no problems. So I will, I will just, um, hopefully you can all hear Paul, but I'll just, um, I'll just introduce him. Paul uh, was born in Blackpool, went to, UCAS, uh, went to Newcastle Uni, is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Spent a bit of time in the lakes, I think. Um, but then moved to Leeds sometime in the early Triassic or, or maybe the late the Cretaceous, Jurassic. Probably, yeah, more like the Cretaceous, yeah. Yeah, yeah. When did you move to Leeds? 1982 stroke three. Okay, so who was, who was around then? Well, Streaky. Uh, a lot of people. Streaky, the Bernard Bernard Newman. Crowd. From, from the Leeds Mountaineering Club, there was people like Chris Souden, Tony Burnell, Mark Sprebra, Jane Sprebra. Yeah, I say Streaky, a whole gang of people, really. The well oiled machine. Well oiled machine. So, so, in like, on the side, I'm kind of working on this guidebook to Yorkshire and looking through the new routes list and like the first ascents and stuff, those names just crop up all the time, especially on limestone. There must have been, there must have been a lot of buzz around, around sort of new routing and new development there, like big lines to go out on the big crags. I think that a lot of that had been driven by a lot of those guys. Of course, there was others around, plenty of other people as well, like Fawcett and Libsy had been around doing various stuff. There was all the Lancashire crew um, doing things. Um, so it wasn't just them, but they, I think they were a, a, a real driving force amongst things. Um, and it, it was interesting at the time because, of course, there was that move at the time from purely trad climbing to the introduction of sport climbing. Mm. So, you know, at Malham, there was, you know, people started to sort of free the, the bolt lines using the old bolt gear, which is interesting. One of my friends, Paul, um, once fell off, pulled out the first bolt off the, off the terrace of the, of the catwalk there and ended up in the river. <laughs> and amazingly walked away from it, sort of jumped wow. around, shaking himself off and, 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 and he was fine. It was fine. Trad climbing. Sorry? Practically track climbing. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, it, it, was, it was an interesting time. Mm. Um, so was there much happening in terms of bouldering or was it all sort of trad 
trad development and sport oh, development. I, I think it's fair to say that by that time, a lot of the major venues were, were pretty well developed. I mean, climbing, you know, bouldering in Yorkshire had been going on since the uh, 1870s when people like Slingsby and others were doing it. And mm. Franklin had done stuff, hadn't he? You know, um, I think there's a quote in uh, Alan Cameron Duff's guide about from Franklin saying something like, there's nothing better, can't spend a better way than to get a lot of mates together and sort of, did desperately he, try and get up some impossible boulder problem and see, you know, vie with each other. So, didn't he? Didn't he say uh, about Matterhorn Arete that it was, it was the most strenuous thing ever achieved by man, and if it was a foot higher, it would be impossible. Mm, don't know that one. That yeah. was that was that was a quote from the Steve Dunning bouldering guide. I'm sure. I'm sure it was uh, Franklin who said that. Yeah, about sure. Matterhorn Arete. Um, yeah, and one thing, I mean, it was obviously uh, by that time, there was, you know, people had been done some horrendously hard stuff, like, you know, Cirrus and people like that, you know, were climbing B8s by then. Mm. Yeah, easily B8s, you know. Um, some of Al Manson's big routes, you know, often regarded as sort of fairly high balls these days, things like Psycho and Adrenaline Rush. Well, Mar Marabou and Jelly. Oh, and jelly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's a, a, a real knee tremble. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Most people, I don't think, would regard that as a boulder problem these days. Would they? Even you, will with your mates and your mats? I I've never really thought of that as a as a high ball because it just the angle of it is not. It doesn't seem quite steep enough that you would fall and just fall and hit the mats. It seems like you would fall and like just either scuff yourself down a slab or yeah. cartwheel down or something. So. That and adrenaline rush, I've kind of hmm. don't have a great deal of interest in going in highballing, but but brave, there's some brave people out there and they do do it, don't they? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, obviously it's probably better without mats than, than sorry, with mats than it, it was when people did it without mats. It's kind of nice because it's spicy, it's still spicy. Oh, it's but, spicy as hell, But yeah. it kind of takes the edge off it a little bit. That's, that's, yeah. I think, I think that's like, in terms of where development is going, there's obviously lots of bouldering still to, to find, but I think finding old solos that used to be really death-defying and then sort of bringing them down to a, a more puntery level by sticking a load of mats under them is really exciting because you kind of get to do these old super routes, but in a slightly kind of a slightly safer environment. Yeah, I, I suppose you could thing. say that, yeah, or you could, no, I, yeah, I, mean, I know some people have the idea that it, it kind of reduces the value of them in some ways because there isn't that level of commitment and risk, but, you know, it's time, things move on, don't they? I, I, think, mean, it, I think it just changes it, like, nobody's, nobody's going out to Stanage and doing, like, routes that Jimmy Puttrell did with Jimmy Puttrell's gear, everyone's taking, like, two nylon dynamic ropes, sticky rubber shoes, big rack of gear, like, but no one's sort of complaining about that dumbing down the experience. It just, it's just a change, isn't it? But there's still loads of genuine chop routes that pads won't tame out there for people to go and do. Yeah, I mean, there's no point in holding back progress. That would be a stupid thing to do, wouldn't it? I mean, mm. if you look back to that time as well, I think, I think the other thing that was interesting um, in, in relation to this presentation, the Unknown Stone stuff was, there's, there's always been that commitment of people going out and doing, you know, the, the you know, classic new problems. I mean, you know, people like Jerry Peel, you know, you could, you could hold up as being a prime example of that. But, you know, there are probably many others. Fawcett in Manson that we mentioned before, um, you know, a huge number of people really at, at that time going out and, and doing classic lines, whether it's Widdoff or Armscliff or, or wherever. Um, but, but there was also, also this sort of side group of people, um, of which Tony Varley was probably um, the prime example, who, who kind of looked at things slightly differently. I mean, Tony did some pretty hard stuff, actually, in his day, you know, doing um, V3s, V4s, you know, back in, you know, way, way, way back when, um, along with his brother Robin and, and, and others, um, occasionally importing other people when he, you know, he found something he couldn't do. But he, he had this alternative vision, I think, which was to actually get out there in different places. I mean, I think, you know, taking the dog and then there was nothing nicer than just wandering miles and miles and miles away and looking, you know, having a different day, really, which was 
I wonder what is over that hill and you know oh there looks to be some rocks over there and you know what is there and can he and fair to say he came up with some fantastic stuff you know here there and mm. everywhere um i mean at the time gamekeepers were a really serious issue and uh, dave musgrove will tell you some fantastic stories about walking across the moors with him and something like get down get down and dropping into the heather because he'd spotted some gamekeeper who had an ongoing you know year year years and years of kind of awful you know battles with but, but, yeah. Well, well this, this is an interesting point because one of the preconceptions that I will talk about later is that people say, oh, well, if it's not been developed already, it must be really crap. But I think people, as, people sort of assume that like all the greats like Ron Fawcett could have easily gone to places like Sipeland and uh, crags like that. But until the Crow Act came in, in in 2000, these places were off limits. And if you were caught there, the gamekeeper would escort you off on the end of a shotgun. Yes. And this, I, and this, I, I was once escorted off a crag at, at, got at shotgun point and with the dogs snapping at my heels at, at around about that time. Um, yeah, it was quite good fun. I mean, you know, if you look at Great Wolf through these days, I think when, when we wrote the guide for that, I, I did that section for the guide. And I think I wrote something like, you know, all the barbed wire and the, and the shot and the uh, machine gun towers have now gone. Well, obviously that's a stupid exaggeration, but not, not that much. Um, you know, a lot of it's people... almost like 20 years ago, somebody sort of took this big upland area where all the rocks are, mm. which hadn't been accessible before, and then it was, okay, you can go there now. And we're still not quite there with going and exploring it all, finding out what's there. Because this, this whole thing started for me when I think I went out with you and John to somewhere... Some, somewhere on Barden Fell or somewhere. And I thought, oh God, this is really good. And then I thought, there must be more of it out there and got, uh, got Google Maps open and started looking for rocks on Barden Fell and sort of made it my mission to go and look at every one of them and to do some routes there. And there was just loads of rock on Barden Fell. Mm. And then there's, I mean, when you walk up to Crookrise, you can, from, from the approach path to like Crookrise and Realstone, you can look out over Barden Moor and there's just rocks and they're not documented and no, nobody's really gone and done anything on them, but they're just sat there waiting for somebody to go and do something with them. Yeah. And, and anybody uh, could go and do something with them. Yeah. And I think it's fair to say, I, I saw Fran on here earlier, Fran Holland, hi Fran, by the way, um, you know, and his good friend, John, John Pearson, who put together YorkshireGrit.com helped to start, start documenting a lot of places. Um, but, I, you know, depends, you know, people looking for the 8A may not have found it in some places, but they may have found some pretty good stuff. Um, That's the point, actually, because things like Rowan Tree Tour on our website and, well, loads of places around Guyscliff and things, Fran and, and, and the late John, um, started developing them and and yorkshiregrit.com was such an amazing resource for sharing information about that yeah and uh, you know obviously there were attempts to do some guidebooks i mean uh, alan cameron dunf's guide you know the york you know bouldering in on in, in yorkshire was interesting in some ways because obviously it documented the main crags um but there were a few pointers in the back for those people who, who prepared to go on those last few pages and Look and, and mm. various things. I mean, the, the, the bouldering in Yorkshire hasn't been that well documented, has it? I mean, there's Steve Dunning's um, couple of books, but I, I guess they're fairly selective. Mm. Um, I think when we did a presentation before, we were talking about Steve Rhodes' bouldering guide, which was a, a classic. I haven't actually got a copy. If anyone's got a copy, I'd love a copy. I've I've got a copy on my bookshelf. Have you? Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, it's yeah. and and the, and the climbs the climbs are rated on a bed system, so. Right, yeah, the, yeah the, a rubbish like a, a normal climb would get no beds, and then a good climb would get a bed because it was worth getting out of bed for, and then a really, really good climb had two beds because it was worth getting out of somebody else's bed for. Yeah, and, and those routes that were worth get some getting out of somebody else's bed for obviously were the, were the classics. Yeah, absolute <laughs> classics. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah. You, men you mentioned before that uh, people were nicking roots off each other. Did you ever nick anyone's route? Oh, never. I've never nicked anybody's route. Did anyone ever nick your route? Tell us! 
We want to know about nicking roots. Uh, none of, mine are always so rubbish, nobody needs to nick them. <laughs> what was it? I think it was Sam Marks who told me a story about Tony Mitchell or someone. Who, can you remember Sam? You said something like, um, he had said something like, we didn't, we went round nicking other people's roots. We didn't want to do the roots. We just wanted to nick them. <laughs> was, that, was that Tony Mitchell, Tony Bennell? Tony Bennell, maybe, I don't know. The, the, one, it was quite, I mean, so the, the obsession I think there was sometimes was, was quite incredible. I mean, I, I climbed quite a bit with Martin Burzins at one stage. And, and um, I remember a particular, Martin would go out and he'd spend, obviously working during the week, but he would spend all day Saturday cleaning a, a line at Gordell. You know, like, you know, seriously cleaning a line at Gordell, mm -hmm. moving the tourists to one side while the block's drained down. But oh. I remember one particular morning where he kind of recruited Tony Burnell and myself because he needed two B-layers um, doing a thing called deconstruction, if you know that on, 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 on Gordon. No. It's sort of over near where, um, oh God, left of, on the, on the right wall. Um, but, you know, big pitch really, you know, big old, big loose rattly E6 pitch. And uh, he was so obsessed and thought that somebody would nick this climb. It's probably not being repeated. I don't know if a few people will have done it. People like Matt Troiler will have done it. But uh, he was so obsessed with it. We had to get up early in the morning, get there. And there was no warm up. It was just straight on to an E6. <laughs> Fucking Gordale as well. <laughs> Tony and myself were holding the ropes while, you know, the, the, he allegedly had cleaned this route, but that his stuff came rattling down, hence deconstruction. And then, of course, we all had to really second this up and climb the upper pitches of it as well. Yeah, you know, it's kind of, yeah but that's that's the obsession of new routing, isn't it? Frightening, frightening. There's a there's an amazing story uh, in the old Felon Rock Guide to. This is the last thing I'll say, and then we'll move on to something else. But yeah, I do. Um, there's an amazing story in the Felon Rock Guide about doing the first ascent of tapestry in on pillar because they decided that Ennerdale needed an E4 because E4 was like the hardest grade at the time. So they'd abseiled down this thing and they cleaned, they cleaned what looked like the crux, uh, which is like these 5C moves on, on layaways. And it was all protected by the worst set of RPs you've ever seen in your life. So they all go up like the next weekend and they, they go to climb it. And they, they set off, one of them sets off from the belay, puts in these terrible RPs, just about scrapes through the 5C moves that they cleaned. And then discovers that the next bit, which they thought looked absolutely steady as anything, was like 6A moves on rock that they hadn't cleaned. And they just watched him go up the rest of the pitch to the belay, absolutely, totally off and on, like nearly dying. He got to the belay and one of them just went, well, that should send the price of diarrhea plummeting. <laughs> just such a such ballsy effort. Uh, right, so... I'm gonna move on. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, I'm gonna move on to talk about a very special young man uh, called Ben. And this is the uh, Ballad of Ben Finley. So when, so when um, I first started to kind of go to Daft Little Crags um, and start to climb, uh, look for d new stuff to develop, Ben was there sitting under Demon Wall roof looking for another a way to eliminate another hold on it. And he was saying, he's a rubbish. It's impossible to uh, find good stuff that hasn't already been done. He wanted to climb eliminates and he wanted to go to Demon Wall Roof and generally just be an incredibly boring climber. Um, I'm trying to think whether there's anything that you should know about Ben. Ben, uh, ben once went on a bike ride with his dad. It was like an orienteering thing. It was a hundred miles. And he woke up the next day with uh, slightly sore legs. Um, and fearing the worst, he went to the GP and asked if he had uh, multiple sclerosis. And the GP had to, had to, had, oh, sorry, no, not, not MS, ME. And the GP, the GP had, to, had to pat him on the back and reassure him that it was all right. He'd, be all, he'd feel better in a couple of days. Um, and then... Um, just just another thing which kind of epitomizes Ben is that a few uh, months ago, I, I very kindly showed Ben how to open the bonnet of his car 
the car that he has owned for seven years. So <laughs> this is this is who Ben is, and he's a lovely he's a lovely bloke. And uh, once I did manage to get him out to the unknown stones, and after all this slagging off and slating, we went to this place called Sigsworth Crag. Sigsworth Crag uh, is this amazing place that's kind of like Yeadon Crag, kind of like Cypland, but just a bit further away from the road. Um, and it looks like it looks like this. It's just this incredible good quality rock all over the place. And because I don't, I don't know if anybody has been there since we went there and there's still loads of stuff to do. So if anybody is looking for like new problems to do, go to Sigsworth Crag, it's really good. Um, and within about five minutes of putting his shoes on, Ben was going, this is amazing. This is the best thing we've ever done. I never want to see Demon Wall roof or the keel again. So we had a great time. And then Ben started to, oh, this is another little line from Six with Craig. You can't see, but there's a nice little, there's a really nice little scoopy groove uh, that goes up there. And uh, Ben started to go out and look for new stuff of his own. And this all sort of culminated. Um, this is a crag called Burnstones, by the way, which is near Slipstones. Um, and it kind of culminated in him finding um, Oh no, and, and he also went to Ashhead and he did Dolly's Dino, which has become a little bit of a uh, crowd favourite. Um, and we ended up going to this crag called Twin Towers, which Ian Henderson, and unbeknownst to him, before him, I think Philippe, Philippe Osborne uh, had also developed it. But they'd climbed this arete on its right hand side, but they hadn't climbed it on the more difficult left hand side. And Ben got very stuck into this project. We ended up going there something like three weekends on the trot. Um, and over the course of about four different visits to the crag, we found it in condition once. Um, and fortunately, Ben managed to climb it. So we've got some previously unseen footage, uh, which I will drop now. Oh shit. I don't know if you can see all these little windows with people in them, but I'm gonna get rid of them. I can't get rid of them. Yes, I can. There we go. Right, roll VT. Right, it's just a wall problem, isn't it? It's quite, it's quite a tough wall problem. If it was a cable, it would be massive. Of course. Right, let's get this one to send. The other thing with this problem was, I am always slightly scared to try it, you know. Don't be, you've not put the problem yet. So I think it's fair to say that we managed to get Ben to be converted to the to the positives of unknown stones. He was a happy boy. So we've got another special guest now to talk to us, who is Lindsay McMorran. Lindsay. Will. Are you there? Hello. How are you? Not too bad. Very good. 
So, who are you? You are a person. <laughs> who are a, am I? A I'm a runner. punter. You're a punter. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we all punters? We are all. Yeah, are I feel punters. like in this sort of like lineup of special guests, I very much feel like the sort of voice of the average punter here, though. So okay. that's that's the role I've taken on. Okay, I'm just trying to see if we can get your video to come up. Can anybody oh see God, you? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Go on, Lindsay. So you're a punter. Um, yeah. But you're... <laughs> That's really mean to yourself. I don't think you're a punter. We're all punters. Um, so you climb with the LMC. <laughs> I do. So I joined the LMC, I think, in 2016. Um, and I was mostly just seconding for people and not really doing any bouldering. And that's quite limiting, really, because you're always relying on other people. Um, so I started to get a bit more into bouldering last year, I think. Mm. Um, and that was, I think, the first time I went up to one of the Unknown Stones crags would have been about June last year. Where did you go? Uh, Sartre Crag and Carn. Sartre Crag. Lovely yeah. crag. Because it, it said that it was like there was loads of easy graded things, and it said that none of it was high, and that the landings were good, which is basically my criteria for bouldering. <laughs> like, yeah. not very tall, not yeah, very yeah. hard, <laughs> not very well, scary. That video of Ben is like a high ball above a crap landing. It's worth mentioning that most of the unknown stones stuff is like over really nice heathery landings, and a lot of it is not particularly high. Like it's quite friendly. Yeah, so that that picture actually, um, I don't think you can see when it's like not on full screen, but like literally the grind is about six inches under me there. <laughs> and you just kind yeah. of go along this little edge and then up this little apex. Is it like a little rise? Is, like the is it like a rise? Well, so what? Yeah, so it's like a rising traverse along the little rail on the top. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, so that's at Thrustcross, and the reason that I ended up climbing this was anybody that was there that particular day may have noticed that being the not very responsible adult that I am, I got really drunk the night before and was feeling rough as a badger's arse on the day we went climbing. So everybody else was like sending stuff, and I was there like touching start holds, like, ah, oh, I just, oh, I don't know about this. Um, so we'd, we'd wandered off a bit further into the forest and what you can't see is on the like sort of the to the left of the picture that face is like a really nice slab yeah. so I did the easier stuff on there and I think the other Lindsay and James were trying this like five plus and I was just getting nowhere with it and I was feeling a bit sorry for myself and I, I looked on the topo and it said that if you go around the side there's a problem with the lying down start which everyone else was like, why would you lie down to start? But hungover Lindsay was like, I can just take my mat around the side of this boulder and lie down and pretend I'm trying to climb it. <laughs> <laughs> so I like took my, I was like, oh, I'm gonna look at this lie down start. So I took my mat down and kind of like lay on my mat. And as I was lying there, I was like, oh, it's quite a nice foothold there actually. And then I thought, oh, well, I'll at least try touching the start holes. And I realized it's actually a really nice rail along the top. So at that point, I'd moved my mat and I'd moved myself. And I thought, well, I might as well give it a go. And it turned out to be a really cool problem. So the, the move in the picture, you feel like a ninja. It doesn't, doesn't look that impressive. It does look good. But, I think it looks really nice. Yeah. So, like, obviously, you could just, I mean, the rock's really textured. You could just smear along it. But where my right foot is, is a massive foothold. So you can mm. just like whack your right foot out and do this nice little rock over. And the whole time you're close to the grind. It's not scary. It's just nice climbing in a nice place. So good cross, way to spend a hangover. Cross, cross, hangover cure, Tarncliffe Top and Sartre Crag. Have you been anywhere else yet? Uh, we went up to Thieves Moss last week. Oh yes, um, yes you went to Thieves Moss. Yeah. Limestone bouldering yeah. in winter, very brave. 
Well, so yeah, um, brave or you know Helen's Ooh, incredible hardy. optimism, one or the other. <laughs> but just say like so, it's like psychic facing, and it's um, quite sheltered. Mm. So it actually wasn't that cold up there. Um, some of the problems do see which is when we'd climbed all the stuff that wasn't seeping was how we ended up adding a new bit onto the topo because I was sat on my mat generally poking wet holes and going no I don't think this is going to happen today and then I turned around and Helen was like halfway up this bit of rock she'd find and she was like this is this is nice this is really nice this doesn't seep we should climb this nice that's that's the thing about new stuff is it's all over the place it's just not pointed out to you because it's not in the guidebook yet yeah, I mean, like, this was literally right beside the main crag of Thieves Moss. So it's just sit in your mat and look around you a bit and you might spot something. That's a nice job for Paul to update the topo. Done. It's, it's done, I think. Done. Done and dusted. He's so industrious. Because he's retired. I know, I know. <laughs> got nothing, obviously nothing better to do with <laughs> Well, don't don't tell Helen that because she she said that she's not good at public speaking, so she's hiding somewhere, not speaking to us at the minute. Okay. Um, but she is like any bit of rock, and she will try and climb it. She's so don't say army. that you've got nothing better to do, or Helen will just send you hundreds of updates. Well, I did notice when you came back from uh, Unknown Stones, uh, the lad that you were with, Dave Short, I think it was. Um, sent a, uh, a very a very assertive email telling us about his new problem, and we were only too well, grateful to receive it. I believe this was the uh, Paul Hollywood handshake. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I was going to say he's on the call, so maybe he can defend himself. The new superline at Belden. Well, that, that's the idea behind it. it was uh, struggling quite badly on the. Uh, on the height perspective of the of the standard climb, so then tried to go um, at it by a different route. So using the the flake on the left, because um, I think the the other guys that were climbing with were in kind of like the five ten range, where myself was five three. So it was either very tough dyno on already tired very arms, um, excuse or, or find a, a well this is it or find a different route of attempting it and. As opposed to just making a, a lousy eliminate climb, I actually found out quite there was quite a nice new climb that could be approached in a different manner where it wasn't just you can't do a certain move, so you, you just try it a different way, you just actually find something totally different and come out at a different angle, which was quite fun. So I wouldn't say it was a save, I was just passionate about the climb. <laughs> it was good fun. <laughs> nice. Cool. Well, have you got anything else to say, Lindsay? Um I would just say, like, I guess people tend to stick to what's in the guidebook. Like, if, if you see so many people posting up, oh, does anybody want to go bouldering the weekend? And they're going to, like, Almscliff or Cayley. If you're one of those people, I think, you know, have a look at um, some of the other stuff because look in the mirror. some of it is really good and it is worth a trip out. Cool. Good shout. All right. Thank you very much for that. So... What we got next? Oh shit, I've got to talk about my favorites. Um, I'll try and be brief and then we'll get onto the headliner, Mark Rankin. Rank Rankin? Rankin. So, um, somebody said that I should uh, describe my favorite uh, crags and climbs and stuff. So, basically, anything at Yeadon Crag, this is Yeadon Crag. Look how big this piece of rock is. Look at the size of it. It's amazing. And it hadn't been uh, developed until like a few years ago. Isn't Will, it? Will, it's Fran. Can I just interject there that me and John went there several times but it never actually got onto uh, YorkshireGrit.com. The retro claims are coming in. Yeah. Hello. Go on, so, so what did yeah. you do there, Fran? Fran? What did you do there? I, when, I, when I can't remember. We did, we did some things on that, on that wall there. And quite a lot out to the left. <laughs> Shit. Um, likely story, can't remember. <laughs> can't, can't remember. Did somebody put a picture, a uh, photo on, of to the right of where you are in that picture of somebody climbing that wall there? 
recently, but I know John had climbed that. You see, that several, the, several the, years. The ago. wall to the right of there, like I don't know if you can see my mouse, but where my yeah, yeah, I can see that there. Yeah. That's like the best new route that I've ever done. And it's being retroclaimed live. <laughs> I I can remember the first time we saw that line there was chalk on it. Really? Yeah. That no was, way. That was, that was going on, that was 2000. Wow. Well, that's really surprised me. I, yeah. I sort of thought that uh, Eden was, because it wasn't really described anywhere. It wasn't on Yorkshire Grit or anything. It, it never, it never got on there. But there was, there's quite a lot of places that never did get on there. I think, I think well, there was things recorded, um, not on there, but on the walls to the left that when, yeah. we, when we first started looking. <clears throat> so on, on all the things just over to the left of there, mm. there, were, there were there was documented um, climbs. But Cause Tom, well, Tom Pleckett and his, and Andy Emery and mates had done a few things, hadn't they? Like the thread. Yeah. Yeah. I think me and John had been there before then. All right. Oh, well, this is this is a mate. This is amazing uh, heckling, Fran. This yeah. Is Sorry. Platinum <laughs> heckling <laughs> to to bring to bring out the, the retro claim. Well done. Yeah. Oh, cool. Well, that's really cool. But anyway, I mean, Eden Eden is still a favourite crack, and there's so there's um. This going up these like loose flakes is a bit rubbish, but it kind of shows off the rock nicely. And there's a really an amazing 7B arete that Will Buck or perhaps Fran Holland uh, did. Probably, probably John did that. Probably John did that. Okay, so going up there, and then there's other stuff on that block, like just to the right of the obvious easy line going up the holes. Um, and then uh, what we call the Sestrian going there. So Eden, Eden Crag, I just love the place because it's always a, uh, an absolute fight when you go there and you wake up the next day and you feel broken. Um, so yeah, uh, the Satellite Boulder, which is like, uh, I think it had been found by a couple of other people there and they'd started work on it, but then Tom Peckett came along with Charlotte Telfer and uh, Andy Emery and people and started to really scrub the moss off it and get to work on it. Um, but it's kind of like the kind of boulder that you see in Switzerland. It's just this amazing overhanging wall of crimps. Um, that's really good. And then pike stones. I quite liked pike stones because there's only this one little problem there, but it's a good one. And it took like a number of trips to the crag to sort of work out the sequence on it and one day I was just doing the dishes and the sequence just sort of popped into my head and it all seems very obvious what I should have been doing. Um, there's this little place on Bailden Moor which is kind of cool. Um, there's this like, you can't really see it here but where the pad is is the landing and if you fall anywhere that isn't on the pad or if you kind of roll off the pad then you fall sort of like five meters down this sort of broken ground here into this kind of bay it doesn't look like that really here um but kind of going up that arete was a lot of fun and then the people's favorite uh which i've not managed to get to yet um is gatehouse crag uh which i think is another fran and john um job which was on yorkshire grit i think um but it's kind of been uh, documented and described um, and it's become very very popular. Yeah I, I used to go there with a guy called Al Allen and uh, it's a lot of things are named after Izzy and Pussy mm. and that was all that was all named after his late mother at the time. All oh, right okay. So, yeah she, she just she hadn't died that long before but she was such a good laugh that we named a load of problems after her. Ah. Interestingly about that one uh, we're Dave Musgrove and myself, pretty sure that that was um, climbed. A lot of the problems have been done by Tony Barley and, and mm. maybe Robin as well, a long, long, long time ago. But it was probably one of the ones that he never got around to documenting. He, I mean, he basically, he used to sort of go home, get out a, a fag packet, and scroll on the back of there, and then stick it in, a, in, a, in an outer way place. And then they would eventually pull these things out. So 
eventually in 1998, of course, he and Nigel Baker did this wild bouldering in Yorkshire. But uh, we're pretty sure he forgot an awful lot. And then later on, he kind of pulled out a load more stuff. And unfortunately, it never got published. And some of it got lost. So. Mm. The, the, the wild bouldering Yorkshire guide, I've got, I think I must have about 10 copies of it kicking about the house somewhere. They're, they're selling for 60 quid a time, you know, Fran. Are they? Yep. You're a millionaire, Fran. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Along with that extreme rock, I'm laughing. <laughs> Made for life there. Um, yeah. yeah, so Gatehouse Crag has become hugely popular because it's kind of got really nice landing, relatively short climbs um, on really good rock. Um, nothing like crazy hard there, mostly in the sort of fours, fives, sixes, that sort of sort of, sort of territory. Um, and then uh, Paul and John Hunt and I went up onto, this is kind of on the flanks of Simon C, um, one night after work once, and we climbed the front of this uh, pinnacle, but I kind of always looked at this side wall here um and got around to going back to do it a couple of years ago um but i just think this block is awesome uh kind of just a big pyramid of grit sitting on the middle of the moor and i think you did something quite scary there didn't you paul some like e4 or something on one of the blocks yeah, with a terrible landing john john called it paul's moment of madness but um, i don't know i don't know how hard. it wasn't that hard it was just a bit mad fair enough um, and then just down the hill from there, uh, literally on the path that, if, if you walk up to Simon's seat, up the path that goes uh, directly up the hill to Simon's seat, you walk past this uh, great big gritstone slab, which everyone always looks at, but never seems to get around to climbing on, but it's the most fantastic little slab. And you can use it as a warm up for uh, Simon's seat. And it kind of gets your footwork engaged. and you know from the first move it feels like you're high up it's it's got a really great landing it's so it's kind of you know all the climbs are safe but by the time you sort of get near the top that's feeling quite high um and then the last go on can i just on an interjection from simon's seat yes uh greg chapman they did the you know the uh lakes climbing guide yeah, yeah. Man, manager at rock and run if you if you're down at apple uh sky around, and you're looking up towards Simon's seat, there's loads of boulders low down. Now, he did a lot of problems there that I think have never been recorded. Oh, Greg so, Chapman did? Yeah, so whether it's worth getting hold of him. Well, I've got, I've got his number if you want to speak to him. All right, he, well, I, I, can, uh, I can... Down there. I'd be interested to talk to him on Instagram or something, because um, there's, other, there's other stuff around there, and this, is, this could be one of them, actually, because when you come out of Trollers Gill, on a on a on an afternoon in the summer when the sun is hitting the kind of northwestern uh flanks of diamond sea it picks out all these boulders on the hillside and this is like the biggest of them um it's this big pyramid shaped block uh the valley face of it is overhanging and uh dave warbs and i had been had been climbing in the gill um and we walked out and we saw this block and we grabbed some pads and went up there. Uh, but at the time we sort of assumed that it must have been a, a Tony Barley thing. But, um, but Dave Warburton's like the best climber in the world, but he's incapable of on-siting anything. Um, and, he, and he'll never go on something unless he's thrown a rope down it first because he's pathetic. Um, so he wouldn't go up this until he had seen me do it. So it was like a personal moment of... Um, feeling even though i hadn't feeling like i'd done one over on dave warbs so i've got a little video of it um so i'm going to play it Thank <laughs> you. 
Right, so time for me to stop talking and let let uh, let loose Mark Rankin. So, are you still there, Mark? That one. Mm -hmm. Hello, I'm still here. Hello, Hi. thank you for coming. So, so should, I, should I just introduce you? Yeah. Okay. Let me see if I can get your camera on. Is your camera on? Yeah, it is. It, it looks like it for me. Okay. Let me see. I'll stop sharing my screen and then. Oh, oh God. <laughs> so Mark, Mark is uh, Mark has climbed in the peak for quite a while, um, and Mark is like Mark's a really good climber. Um, if if you took like Johnny Dawes's sperm. And and mixed it with Jesus, oh, and mixed it with Jesus's sperm, and then <laughs> and then like shoved it into a gritstone womb. Then ten months later, Mark Rankin would pop out, not not like as a baby, but just as he is now. Wouldn't it, is that is that fair to say? That's fucking weird. <laughs> <laughs> so. I think you're moving away from the peak now, aren't you, Mark? I'm down in Cornwall at the moment, yeah. Yeah, I, is that like a permanent thing or is that a... Um, it was going to be, but it's looking like it's probably not anymore. It's so probably okay. a, few, a few months. Okay. But you've, you're going to talk to us about some stuff that you've been doing on Grit? Yeah. Are we doing the videos first or are we doing uh, talking? We could do some... Whichever. I think if I did the videos, then it might jog my memory. Okay, let's do the videos then. Um, so, oh shit, where have they gone? Here we go. Can I, can I, see no, me? I can't see these. Share your screen again, Will. All right, hang on a minute. Let me share my screen. I can see Lindsay. Okay. Oh. Um, God, Zoom is such an arse ache. Okay, have we got the, have we got YouTube? Yeah, I can see YouTube. Okay, cool. Right, what's this first one, Mark? This is a Rivling Quarries. This is the latest development. Rivling Quarries, is that quite close to Rivling? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, like, it is just to the left. left. Same, same approach, you just turn left. All oh, right, and people just haven't been turning left. Uh, well, there's, there's some old, there's plenty of roots and stuff, and there's a bit of bouldering in the first quarry, but further along, well, there's, there's no recorded bouldering. Well, no, there's a few bits again, actually, much further left, but yeah, just all along, there's little bits and pieces to this. Oh, well, I've seen I've seen this video. This one looks really nice. Let's uh, let's watch the video. When I when I heard your voice then, Mark, I thought that was you on the Zoom call, like egging, <laughs> egging <him> on. <laughs> um, okay, so like, who's the climber there? Uh, that's Steve Ramsden, who's done a lot of stuff in the North Yorkshire Moors. He's yeah. done a lot of new stuff. Uh, right, cool. Um, I don't know how I get you back. I don't know if I can get you back. Shall I play another video? 
Yeah, roll the videos. Yeah, okay. So wh where's this place? This is Crowd and Quarry. This is near Lado. It's a quarry near Lado, just off right. the uh, main road. I was getting this not like track climbing in there. there. Not, not like a Lado sized walking, like roadside. No, well, it's up a hill, but it's near, there's like a youth hostel there, isn't there? And it's just okay. like up the hillside. And it's actually quite a nice spot when you get there. Yeah, some quarries are um, a bit grim, but it's yeah. quite, quite a nice Yeah, it's quite, quite open and sunny. Um, fast drain. Yeah. And you say it's a uh, trad. There's loads of trad climbing in the, there. Yeah, I don't know if anyone actually goes there. There's, yeah, yeah, there's some long routes as well. Yeah, long routes. And there's uh, quite often peregrines nesting at the top. All oh, right, okay, cool. Uh, right, I'm going to play it. I don't, think, I don't think I've ever seen you cut loose before, Mark. Very cool. So who, who are you with in, in these ones? Is that James? Uh, James Jacobs. Cool. And who's the other guy? Uh, my mate Liam. Very nice. So how did you come across these little gems? You just kind of went to a trad crag and just yeah, I was, yeah, especially places that even for trad crags aren't that popular. Especially yeah. ones you know where the roots were done in the eighties or something when bouldering wasn't really. Especially it's such a big crag, no one's going to have bothered doing things like that before. So yeah, yeah, I think you look in the book and you see there's some blank bits between the cracks, and then you, on a rainy day, you go for a walk with the girlfriend. That's kind of like some of the spots that have been developed in Yorkshire. Kind of like like Ash Head was kind yeah. of in the old grit guide as a trout crag, but and I, I think there had been a little bit of bouldering development, but not not really in kind of like doing any of the hard stuff or making it popular or kind of describing it really. Um, then there's there's yeah generally if you can find a crag where there's only trout climbing being done there before. There'll generally be some blocks at the bottom that nobody will have bothered to, yeah. to, to do before. 
And there's lots of crags in the old books that I, I just mentioned out there, and uh, so and so's done a couple of ediths here. And they're always worth a look because it doesn't take much rock to make, to have like Brad Pitt there. Because, you know, yeah. that's just let in a little hole, isn't it? So as, yeah. I suppose that's the thing when you're wandering around in the woods and stuff, you think, <coughs> we'll just go around the back of that boulder because you never know what might be in there. Yeah, it kind of looks like a little, a little knee-high thing sticking out of the ground, but it might have a face on it that drops away. And if you've got six foot of rock and a sit-start... <laughs> cool. Um, and then I've got the I've got the last video here. So is this. Uh, so of course, yeah, there's, there's stuff at the main crags as well, isn't there? You know. So this is at Kerba, and this is directly below Art of Japan, which is like a super popular problem. Loads of people do that. Yeah. So just below it is this old E four six B. I think Andy Barker. E46B. So it goes up to like the finger rail and traverses left. So just ju just when you're out, just look at these things and think, oh, I wonder if you can go direct. Just keep your eyes open. Keep your eyes open, yeah. And then the other day, actually, they left a ret. There's an HVS that traverses in from the block on the left. So the other day, I did that left a ret straight up. It only had to come That didn't have a direct start. Yeah. Kerbe. Madness. So, but I mean, I, someone might have already, you know, done that before, but not recorded anyway and mm. yeah, a good little day out doing that and some other bits around there so cool right You know, Graham Hammond broke my chalk bag then, he ripped it clean off. Nick. I see you've moved your spotter. <laughs> he won't come back. <laughs> <laughs> What goes up the arete just above you? So the, the HVS, it just comes in from a block on the left. There's a little crack and then it comes out sort of that slot and then up that black lake. I mean, can you see where my mouse is? What goes up this arete? Uh, which one? So kind of like on the edge. Just uh, so there's, a, there's an E6 called Rocky Horror Show which goes up there. Oh, right, okay. I, I hope you there. finished with it. <laughs> Oh, and that's Matt Ferrier. Legend. Yeah, he just absolutely rinsed it. War whisperer. He's, he's a real wizard. You should pull his finger out and do something really hard. Mark, how hard was left a of that block that you mentioned? Um, it's just one move to pull on, really, about 6C, I think. All oh, right, OK. Well, we've got another live retro claim coming in. <laughs> now I seem to remember mentioning it to you as a possibility. Oh, ah, right. <laughs> yeah, it just took a while to go get back around to it. Yeah, <laughs> get there quicker than me. <laughs> oh, come on, retro claim him. <laughs> God, not on that one, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> so that is, that's the videos that we've got. But um, I wanted to just have a little chat to you, uh, Mark, because you're kind of like... I don't know you very well. I think we've met once, haven't we? But we went up to Baden Fell, didn't we? I had a brilliant we had a day. Nice day at Baden Fell. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. And I, you made my day that day 
I don't I don't want to be like trying to uh, big myself up or anything, but um, we were there with your mate Neil. And Neil the, and Michaela. And uh, and you, what was it? We went to do and she was. I can't remember which way around they are, but there's and she was and there's oh, other. Oh yeah. And. And we both, we all did the Aret thing. And then Michaela and Neil and I did the middle of the block. And you didn't do it. And I thought, this guy's done Gaia ground up. And I've just, I've just burnt him off. This is the best day of my life. <laughs> Obviously, I didn't say anything. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how to... Um... It's, it's really high. That, that wall is, I think, higher than it looks in the photos. It's, it's, it is, well, it's... Uh, you could fall off the top, but I don't think you'd want to fall off the top. It's, it, top. Is, it is scary. Um, so, so I don't know you very well, but I think of you as being a bit like a David Warburton kind of climber. In, uh, I'm not as good as Dave Warburton. Nobody's as good as Dave Warburton. Even Adam Andra's not as good as Dave Warburton. No. But, um, but Dave Warburton will only go climbing at a place where he can be absolutely certain that he will not see anybody else and it's not so much that he's a he, it's not so much that he's antisocial or anything but it's more just that he really likes seeking stuff out because it's obscure and i kind of wondered why do, you, why do people like doing things that are obscure it's, it's nice it's nice to go somewhere quiet i think it's nice to do something that you know no maybe not many other people have done it feels a bit more personal doesn't it even mm. if it's not a new route or, or even a second you know just quieter things and there's not necessarily videos about it and you have to work work it out a bit more and everything can take a bit longer but get a bit more of a whole experience with it don't you yeah that's what i quite like about it you know cleaning it and and working it going there on your own and having a little play and then getting your mates to come out if he's not had to clean it, then it's not, it's not worth it to him. <laughs> People will go out of their way to never clean anything. And it's kind of strange that there's that duality of what makes a good climbing. Yeah, experience. well, equally, though, some days you're a bit short for time where you just want to go out and get some mileage and you, you go up to Stanage and mm. do the classic circuit stuff and that's great as well, isn't it? But mm. I, I have a theory about this and it's kind of like... Because one day, one day we took Warbs to, uh, we forced him to go to Frogger and uh, we did strapidectomy and he came down from it with the biggest grin on his face <laughs> and he went, now that is a classic. And it was like, and he really enjoyed it, but you could see, yeah. you could tell that he kind of turned up at the crag wanting to not enjoy it and then he enjoyed I it. Yeah, I sometimes as well think though, you know, I've, I've not done that route because you feel like there's a bit of pressure on and you don't want to fall off it. So I well, think Dave sometimes Warburton, when you... Dave Warburton didn't fall off it. Well, that's why I enjoyed it. I bet it would have, I bet it would have been shit if you fell off it. A rarely flashed strap to me. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, sometimes, so you go to these obscure groups, there's no pressure on you then, is there? And you yeah, can, and then if someone yeah. says, oh, what did you get done at the weekend? Oh, I just went and and scope some stuff out or it's had a little fail on a route that everyone else is yeah so i don't know maybe it's a bad thing really you should be getting on all the classics and proving yourself mm. like um yeah i know what you mean actually because i like i find it really hard to on-site a route that you really want to on-site yeah you build it up a lot don't you yeah you have to you kind of have to get the jittery go out of you first and then once the yeah point, yeah sometimes you're better off just falling off quite early on and then you can enjoy it whereas if nobody knows what it is that you're climbing and nobody cares like like it's not a big name or anything i i have a little theory about this and that i think roots roots that get done a lot and they're really classic they're really good because almost because lots of people do them like great western at armscliff everybody remembers doing Great Western at Armscliff the first time because it's kind of like this common experience that people have and it's like you could sit down with lots of different climbs in Yorkshire having not met them before and you've got this like shared experience of like traversing along that break getting quite pumped looking around for that hidden pocket that hidden jug thing and kind of if you do it at a time when it's a hard route to you then 
everybody gets that same experience and everyone can kind of relate to each other. But then if you go to, but then the more obscure climbs, they're kind of, they're amazing for completely the opposite reason. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. In the, they're completely not like that in that not many people have had that experience, but then that's kind of what makes it special. Like if you walk along a footpath and only a few people have walked along it before, you can kind of see their footprints and you can kind of, it, it feels like, it's almost like a personal connection with that person. You can see how they walked and where they walked. And if, if something's had a lot of traffic, then there's lots of footprints and it's all become sort of churned up. But on the um, more obscure stuff, like, you know, that thing at um, Harmer's Wood that Andy Pop did. Mm -hmm. So I think there's like, so Andy got me to, Andy got me to, to do that when we were at the crag together. And then I think you repeated it. And I think Mark Ferrier repeated it. And I'm sure Matt, yeah, Matt Ferrier did it. Yeah, a couple of years ago. And then I went a, a few weeks ago and uh, Dan Cheatham did it. Oh, did he? Yeah. <laughs> His lattice training plan got him up it then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it yeah. kind of feels, it feels then like, it's almost like a little club of, not, not like a club, but it kind of, I feel like you do get a little connection to the other people who have, I mean, Harmer's Wood's a bit different because it's a popular place for like dog walkers and people to go. But if you think of somewhere that's like high up on a moor somewhere and maybe there's not any footpaths going to it, like there's not that many humans who will have been there and mm, who will have yeah. been and gone and had that experience and done that thing. I just find that really, I find that really kind of, I'm, a, I'm quite a sceptical and cynical person, but I, that to me is like as far into the spiritual or the metaphysical as I will get, I feel really, it feels really special to go to special places. Yeah, and yeah. And well, certain places strange things. feel a lot like that more than others, don't they? I think Baden Fell is one of those places. I think that's absolutely magical up there. And you feel like well, it's quite quiet up there and you feel like the only person who's climbed all them things, don't you, when you're up there? Mm. I think, because it just feels so remote. Have you been to Will's Seat before? Uh, perhaps. Is that one of the Garden Fell ones? Yeah, so it's basically, if you get yeah. to the top of the path um, that comes out of the woods, then you kind of turn left to get to Simon's seat and everything. But if you go, if you carry on and go up the hill a bit, you, there's this thing that's out on the fell and there's no footpaths to it. And there's- I'm sure we went on that same day, Well, No, 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 we didn't go there. We went to Lord's seat. Oh, right. But, but, uh, but Earl Seat is a place where there's a thing called Jams to the Slaughter, which is an HVS. And there's a thing called Off With His Head, which is a VS. Um, and there's a, there's a really good, there's a really amazing V diff that kind of takes you on a trip through the crag. Um, and amazingly, it's called, it's called Womb With A View. And there were two parties who were sort of developing this little crag um, at the same time as each other, but they didn't know that each other was doing it. Right. And when they compared notes later, they found that each of them had called the same, this v <laughs> they called it Womb with a View. Um, but then just recently, uh, I had kind of had this project there and I got bored of it because it was a bit of a skin ripper and I wasn't good enough to do it. Uh, but Dan Varian and Alex Moore went and did it and gave it 7B plus. And then Dan Varian, they did this long standing last great problem. Um, as well there which got a big number uh, it's it's a really there's not very many climbs there but they're all really worth doing there's everything from sort of vs well actually everything from vdiff through severe uh vs hvs up to kind of like really hard bouldering men and there's really and, there, and actually i don't think we ever quite recorded it i'm sure that john and fran did it but um just around on the blocks uh Underneath he'll see there's some absolutely mangling uh, bouldering jamming cracks and there's absolutely fierce uh, there's this amazing problem of Paul's called a uh, gargling crack where you kind of have to you have to get this sloper and then you kind of have to do like a pirouette and you have to throw yourself leftwards and catch the other side of this crack and then kind of like keep your body going leftwards so that you come round into a layaway it's like one of those um, moves that you see at the Olympics and stuff where they're like throwing <laughs> blobs, at blobs. You, you really have to like throw your body um, like around the crag to get the holds to work in the right way. It's really cool. 
But Barton Fell is such a special, mm. special place. Amazing place. It's what? not all about the moors. Go there's, on. I, there's stuff in the woods that me and John and somebody else found that have never been climbed. And what? I know where the biggest roof in Yorkshire is. Some Oh, is this the next stones? Yeah. Now, I, I don't know if you've seen, but that's been uh, done by James Turnbull and people. Has it? Yeah. There's, well, I don't know, perhaps it, it, perhaps it might not be the line that you envisaged, but they've certainly done a line that goes through the kind of the weakest point of that roof. But you're that's absolutely good. right that just next to Slipstones in the woods, there's some absolutely titanic bits of rock. Yeah, and me and, me and John did some good problems along there as well that never got recorded. Yeah, I mean, the, if, yeah. if you go on Unknown Stones now um, and look for Crag A, um, it's kind of got a little bit of an access issue on it in that it's a private woodland that's used for forestry and sort of, you know, don't get seen going there, etc. cetera. But um, it's documented on Unknown Stones under, as Crag A. Crag um, A? Yeah, I think, I think I'm sure, um, I'm sure it says in that guide that you guys probably went there because I think when somebody, oh yeah, I yeah, think yeah, you had yeah. A of that roof on UKC. Yeah, I put I put a picture of it on there years and years ago. Yeah, that's a, it's an amazing roof, isn't it? I, I remember putting a picture of it on Instagram, and Robin Muller said something like, "There was a roof as big as that in Lancashire, but it fell down." Yeah, <laughs> kind of very Lancashire. Oh uh, yeah, I can. I, uh, yeah, I've got it on here. I can see all this. Yeah, yeah. We probably, did. we probably yeah retro claim in here a few lines. I'm t I'm telling you, Fran, you've got a lot of work to do to go through all of unknown stones and get your retro claims in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then and then uh, there's some bigger rets lower down the Washburn Washburn Valley from Thrustcross. Is that um? There's a place called Rabbit Crag. Is that one of them? I don't know what it's called. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Then the details, I, man. You've got you've got a load of converts here, here now. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. So there's, there's just so much that never got put on there, and yeah, yeah. Happy happy days, me and John had. Happy days, happy days. So, um, Mark, did you want to say anything else about? you know, the peak and what have you? Um, well, I'm no authority on peak district climbing or peak district esoterica, but there's plenty out there. I need to write up a lot of stuff, really. Um, there's the riveling stuff, a few bits and pieces. Yeah. Um, yeah, not, not yeah. a whole lot, much else to say, really, but I think if you want to find a new Craig, um, look at the magnesium limestone band and where it runs because obviously you've got Anston stones and crags around there and then up to like Church Crag. Mm. If you look online, there's like a, a band of that rock that goes almost up to Northumberland. It, it, go, it goes up to like past Ripon and stuff. Yeah, and it's like two miles wide. So if you overlay that onto OS maps and look for steep sided valleys and little crags. Yeah. There's got to be like more Anston stones and church crags I, further I, north. Like people, look, uh, people look for Yorkshire limestone building in like in the kind of areas that you would think like Kilnsey and, and yeah. Trollhill and stuff. Um, but real like that magnesium limestone, I don't know if many people have really scoped out, and you're absolutely right that yeah. and also it tends to form. form. It tends yeah, to like form his house. He's done. And you know, there's a load of stuff that, as you say, it runs right up to Northumberland. Yeah. In that band of rock, there must be some bits of it where it pokes out above the ground. Yeah, and you'd, and again, it, it tends to form really good crags, doesn't it? Like low roofs. And Amazing. so you don't need much of much rock for there to be a potentially really good little limestone roof. Like Anston Stones, Dave and Sam went there the other day, and both the enormous laybys were full. It's like yeah. the savage of the Peak District now, because it never rains that far. Yeah, 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 and it, the weather's always better, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, if, if anybody's listening and, and wants to get the GIS out and start to kind of like put overlays on maps, get to it, because it's, it's all there to play for. There, there's, there's a, there's a, is a quite a long limestone crag 
that I've looked at but never climbed on. And just just near Ripon, and there's a lot of lanes called White Stone Cliff or White Cliff Lane, mm. and that leads onto farmland. And there's a long limestone crag there. And also, if you go to Fountains Abbey and follow the valley up at the top of that valley, there's another limestone crag there. Fountains All Abbey. Up. Yeah. Hmm. I can't wait. I can't wait to see like tomorrow and and Sunday like lines of crags driving out of Leeds trying to get to these trying to get to these places it's probably all a red herring Fran's going Fran's going somewhere else yeah <laughs> competition I'm off the world <laughs> <laughs> all right cool well um I guess there's probably we there's probably not much time that we can keep people but I've got like one last little bit which is um uh hang on hints and tips so if i go to zoom can i share my screen again yeah okay this is the last little bit now so if you've stuck with us thank you for thank you for sticking with us it gives my ego a great boost uh let's see oh shit oh yeah i've got pictures of your stuff at lady bower tour uh some nice little low balls you did yeah there's a long boring video so nice that's a nice little crag nice little crag um so tips and tricks uh this is a video that illustrates the importance of not letting your friends especially if they're a lot better than you at rock climbing get wind of your project because we had gone mob handed to yeadon and uh we've been climbing stuff over over on the right hand side of this kind of wall here and I wanted to do this line going up out of this pocket and I kind of thought, sod it, I'll give it a go. And if somebody sees me trying it, then maybe they'll do it and that's fine by me. I won't be crying into my Cheerios later. No, no, that's fine. And then big, tall, strong Dominic Rag uh, spotted me trying it and swooped in to, uh, to nick it. Although, to be honest, he's probably going to get retroclaimed here. But... Um, if you listen all, the ones to all the ones to the right have been retro claimed. <laughs> oh, but not this one. Not that one. Okay. So if you listen closely, you'll get some very special Sam Marks director's commentary. Roll VT. Okay. Oh, I'm just filming at home. Dominic Rag stealing Will Hunter's problems. Yeah. Oh, Will won't be happy about this. Will will not be happy. He goes, oh, pissed, pissed. Come on, come on. I think you're fucking hell, Will. I appreciate you. I'm not making it. Oh, but he's struggling. He's struggling. Maybe he won't do it. So I quite like how I kind of, you can see me at, at the side, hating my life. Um, and then this, this one uh, is a very important lesson, which is that if your friend is about to succeed and get up something first, then you must try and sabotage them using any methods available to you. And then if you can't do it, you can just cheat.
That's it. Does anyone have any questions? No. no. I think there's some questions for you in the chat, actually, Will. <laughs> when will it end? Have you got anything to say, Sam? No. <laughs> right well in that case thank you all for coming and uh see you out on the crack sometimes yep see ya all right bye everyone bye, bye. bye. thank you bye. Bye.